Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of metaphysics. But let's move on to the battlefield I do war in. Realism versus anti-realism. The skeptical demon portal to epistemology here is the greatest of all those on the battlefield of Philosi. Perhaps such is the reason for my attraction to this area, the desire to slay this demon. I smell its witchcraft through the portal as it influences this area on the battlefield of Philosi less filtered than any other. You see, realism versus anti-realism is a much greater battlefield within the field of epistemology itself. But here it is actually scientific realism versus scientific anti-realism. Scientific anti-realism are still very much realist one might say about certain things like telescopes and microscopes and the instruments of investigation, things we plainly observe like the glass beakers scientists use in the lab. But they are anti-realist that is, they are skeptical about the actual existence of unobservable theoretical things like electrons, quarks, and quantum strings. These things are for them merely a part of invented hypotheses to explain the things we do observe, and we can never really be sure that they hold as true. The strategy here, as I employ it at least, is then to push the scientific anti-realist off the anti-realist cliff and show them as only superficially distinct from the philosophic variety which would not say observable things that they wish to be realist about. Grover Maxwell tries to go step by step to show that the distinction of observables versus unobservables is arbitrary. For example, directly observable is presumably observing things with a naked eye, but then would that mean people who wear eyeglasses don't observe anything that has reality? That seems absurd. Now say their glasses were strong. And what level of strength do you draw the line where suddenly they are not seeing reality? Isn't that then slowly becoming a microscope? And so on. The observable versus unobservable distinction is clarified famously by Boss von Frazen. Again, while grays may exist where there is no clear distinction, that doesn't mean the distinction has no meaning at all referencing back to what I said in episode 1 of my show dealing with demarcation, a response from Michael Roos to Larry Lauder. Von Frazen offers a case of the charged particle in a vapor chamber, of which its path is inferred only by the silver line of droplets formed from condensed vapor onto nearby recently ionized atoms. Sounds strange, but compare that to a jet we see in the sky and its trails. Eventually I can point to the jet in front of the vapor trails and say see, there it is. But if that jet couldn't actually be seen, one might say you're not seeing the jet, you're only seeing the vapor trails and explaining it by positing a jet. So we aren't seeing the charged particle, we're only using the theoretical concept of charged particles to explain what we do observe in the vapor chamber. We don't need to believe them real. Their use is merely pragmatic. One might argue the continued pragmatic usefulness of the theory indicates that it is actually true. This is called the numerical argument. But that's more or less inference to the best explanation, which as we have seen may still have to deal with how it values the probability of alternative theories and of course we might actually have theories which historically were very successful which posited theoretical entities, yet didn't turn out to be true. Phlogist on anyone? Larry Lauden, back again, has a grocery list of those cases. In response to that list, some mollify their position and say it only indicates an approximate truth, which makes the list way smaller, but it's not like cases can't be found where the theory is not even approximately true despite being successful for its time. Take the wave light theorem. Paul Churchland though, Ian Hacking, Arthur Fine, forgive me this area is restricted. I have redacted this area for my personal future use, where I shall myself go into battle and encourage you to subscribe to my channel so that you can witness the explosive exciting events that will occur. 
Yes, the demon portal will be used. Just as I am traveling now to the battlefield of metaphysics to dismantle the weapon of relativism, I will use this portal to go to my homeland on the battlefield of epistemology for however long it takes and slay the greatest demon and cause a chain reaction to all the deviations throughout all the battlefields where a demonic aura is reaching its presence. And that great victory will be sh- uh, well anyway, just, just keep on watching. Where are we now? Pretty adjacent to this area. There is a proto-realism, anti-realism plateau, one might say, of objectivity in science. This is the area of the science wars. If you remember back to Kuhn, Kuhn's philosophy of paradigms being incommensurable and all experimental evidence being theory-laden creates an access point for those who want to challenge the notion of the rational, nature-informed, objective progress in science. This was explained in episode 4. Please watch, I know that you will absolutely love that episode. We had three questions, how these gates were created, who the enemy are, and what exactly is this dangerous philosophic weapon they wield. After explaining how these gates were created in episode 4, then, while taking our boat called Justified True Belief to the battlefield, in episode 5, we took Stefan Cole's account of who the enemy are that made use of these gates. The enemy are not scientists, nor philosophers. They are a specific movement of sociologists called the SSK. Please watch both my supplement video and the video for episode 5, which elucidates who have come onto the philosophic battlefield to do war attacking science with that dangerous weapon. Philosophers respond and defend against these attacks and are backed up by historians. Now again, I will consider them the enemy because of the weapon they are wielding. That is why instead of heading straight to the battlefield, I made a stop off so I can access this portal to the metaphysical battlefield which I am in right now. It is a philosophic weapon that Cole indicates was in fact being wielded to an extreme degree and once I am in the metaphysical battlefield, I will show that these weapons of relativism held to such a degree is not acceptable. After dismantling the limits of this weapon, I will return to the science wars. There are a few battles that I may cover once I get back. I hope I can return to do them if I survive this trip. Please support me on my Patreon or share my videos to ensure my survival. We'll get into these direct and specific battles or others if you'd like. The final area is more modern specialty area where I have insufficient experience and knowledge in to be placing specific warriors and their battles as yet. Also the philosophic issues in these areas seem to me to be more about other philosophic battlefields than the philosophy of science necessarily. Broken up to three areas, one of these areas we might say is where philosophical problems arise from physics. Classically, we might think of problems such as absolute space, or new philosophical questions raised by quantum physics, such as the Copenhagen interpretation. And then there is philosophical issues in biology, such as the classification of species. Where do we draw the line between one and another species, or which system do we use? And of course then there is also assessing sociobiology, or evolutionary psychology. Which leads us into the final area that I think more so might be considered the philosophy of mind but clearly does therefore connect to the philosophy of science or at least what psychology and science is doing together. For example, dealing with what consciousness is, or say how one can attempt to quantify humanistic concepts like love or hatred I suppose. I might in the far future visit these areas since I do have some rough semi-original ideas I think. But I'd also certainly like to talk about the advocates of the hard science definition of science, who of course might be setting up this port from the demarcation area to separate themselves from psychology, sociology, and political philosophy as being not sufficiently scientific enough to share credit in the same light as say physics or chemistry. So this was my map of the battlefield of Philosi, the philosophy of science. Yes, I made it myself, script, characters, animations, all of it. So it's not one that all philosophers share, obviously, and while I'm sure philosophers have some sort of mental conceptual map wherever they are, not all or maybe even very very few would even consider actually trying to create a visual 2D map mimicking land masses, but that's what this show does. I visualize philosophy in the most entertaining way you will ever find on the internet. 
probably. So if you are new to philosophy and you enjoyed this uh, video, I suggest watching it a couple times or just coming back to it as you move around on the map as you're discovering different things. I think that if you are familiar with philosophy and you're actually a warrior yourself on the philosophic battlefield, uh, specifically of the philosophy of science, you will find this map just uh, very light, very light, crispy, uh, salad, almost. And if you think it's fun too, share my work. And now, please go eat something, and sleep. And remember, anytime anyone ever claims so boastfully, I win, or this is the end of philosophy, I've answered all the questions, or somehow solved philosophy itself. Remember, philosophy is like a chess game, but without borders. There are always more enemies, there are always more battlefields, and philosophers keep battling. Sure, 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 sure,